All right, our first question. Do you anticipate a decrease in longevity of the trees when going to a high density planting? That's a very good question. Um, there's actually, like I said, it's not a new concept. Chile and Colombia have been doing this for decades already. And according to their research, this is their research on their land with their trees, after about the 10th to 12th year, the tree will actually start to decrease in production. Um, I believe they have has, but they have different rootstocks than we do. So I don't know if that has to do a factor in it or the environmental or whatever the case is. But they saw after a decade or so, they did see the trees start to start to decline in production. So we still don't know whether, you know, economically, is it worth it, you know, having trees for a decade ripping them out and putting in a, a new high density, you know, versus the long term 20 by 20 spacings and just have it sp um, paced out because there are some growers that still have are still producing um, trees on a 20 by 20 spacing for 50, 60 years. So, you know, we don't know that yet. But in California terms, um, we don't know if the trees are going to affect the same way. We suspect that it will, but because we worked on Hass, the trees were just too hard to handle. We couldn't handle the pruning and the high density. So that was kind of, it wasn't a lost cause, but it was kind of like, okay, we need to try something different. So I think with this high density, we're going to try to keep it, luckily, if we get more funding as long as possible, because I want to also see if these trees also start to decline in production as well. So that, so that is a very good question because the trees are working so hard to produce so much fruit so early in its life, you know, does that cut its lifespan, you know? So yeah, that's a good question. Very good, thank you. The next is more or less a statement. I thought leaf tip burning is a part of potassium deficiency. It can be a sign of it, but most of the time, about 90% of the time, it's always going to be because of the chloride or any of the salts that are in the um, that are in the water. Because, like I said, the these trees, oh my gosh, they're so finicky. Anything goes into the water, it's going to show up within the leaves. Um, so, um, so tip burn is usually the first sign of it and usually if it's a type of mineral deficiency there's going to be some type of pattern to it where tip burn it, it will just start from the tip and just like burn all the way up to like the end you know um, but usually if, if, if it's mineral type of deal then there's some pattern to it and it usually shows up throughout the tree whereas tip burn can happen anywhere throughout the tree on the old leaves on the new leaves and um, there's no pattern to it Next question. Is Jim as good on shipping as Haas? We don't know yet. We're going to find out. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned. This is, well, this, this is going to be a, one of my career career life um, trials. So I'll, I'll tell you in about 10 years. Where. <laughs> I was just going to say, well, Dev, we'd be honored to have you back. <laughs> okay, next question. What are the chilling hour requirements for Jim? Are there other vulnerabilities to climate change? Um, Jim, like I said, these are subtropical trees. So they can tolerate some heat and some cold. I believe the Jim, they're a little bit more sensitive. Like Fuerte um, is, um, can tolerate as low as 24 degrees for more than five hours. Gems usually will not go that um, will will not survive that low. Usually in the high twenties, usually around similar to Hass, around twenty nine degrees um, is the coldest it can get, but it can't be more than five hours. So you have the extreme cold, the the extreme heat. Um, back three years ago, we had a huge heat wave that hit like um, most of the parts of San Diego, where it was hitting one hundred and twenty for up to three days straight. Um, that did affect and kill a lot of the younger trees. Usually the younger trees become more susceptible to any of the climate change things that are happening for that. Um, let me see here. Um, in San Diego, believe it or not, we had snow. My first year here, we had snow. We had wildfires. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things that are currently um, putting challenge. Um, usually the larger trees, um, they do get hit a little bit, but they team tend to always bounce back. If you have a younger tree that's under two, three years old that gets hit with anything climatic factors, most likely you're going to have to replace it because it just it's just way too sensitive. Do alleys remain exposed for high density gem or is there a complete canopy cover? Um, with um, with gem, I have not seen an orchard that's more than five years old. So, but from what I suspect, for instance, for the Hass, there was complete um, there was complete coverage. You could not see the the floor, which was actually kind of a good thing in some aspects because it did prevent weeds from popping up. Um, so they so they had good weed control. Um, but as for the smaller trees, um, I saw the five five and six year old grove and you could still see the floor. So um, from my experience, um, yeah, yeah, you can still see the floor. I don't know what a, what a 15 year old grove looks like because we, you know, we haven't really seen them in California yet. Um, but um, I'm sure there's going to be some type of um, floor that you can see because these trees are a little bit more columnar versus the actual Hass. And Joel Kramer commented when you were talking about mulching, fantastic. The RCD of Greater San Diego County would be interested in seeing the results of soil organic carbon resulting from the mulch over time. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Mulch over time. Mm -hmm. Organic okay. carbon changes. All right. And another question related to your mulch. Mm -hmm. Have any producers used biochar instead of mulch? And then I would also tag on maybe even the combination of um, biochar and mulch. Biochar? No, I, I have personally have not worked with biochar. That's um, Milt McGiffin. He is a UCR specialist and he works with biochar all the time. But most of the stuff that he's worked with has been with vegetables. And from when the conversation I had with them, because I believe we did wanted to try biochar, but um, we couldn't get funding for it. And it's so expensive from what Milt was saying that um, usually with high specialty row crops, you can get away with it because you can afford it. But because biochar is just so expensive to maintain and so expensive to apply and get um no one has done research on it so it's hard for me to be able to comment on how well it would actually work but i heard from milt when he's used it that it's worked wonders with him thank you next question um does avocado plant more mycorrhizal dependence since its roots have less root hairs um it that's that's a good question. Um, it does, and there's been people wanting to do research more on that, you know, to actually bump up the micro um, rise on numbers. And um, it's it's hard for me to answer that question because that's not really my specialty. But um, but. Yes, they do depend on it, but like I said, we 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 put in so many things into the soil to leach it out and to not leach it, and so um, yeah, that's kind of hard for me to answer. But I do know that um, that they do depend on it, and that I want to say Ben Faber has mentioned that he's I don't know if he's done research or he's going to do research on that, but that is something that needs to be looked into. And back to the mulch, how many inches of mulch slash compost do you recommend for new avocado groves and established ones? Um, about five to six inches and just make sure for the newly planted ones that the mulch isn't touching the scion. So you want to make sure that it actually doesn't touch the wood itself, the actual tree, um, because that can cause like decay and can cause um, root rot to come in and phytophthora and all that 
Um, the same with the larger trees. However, once the larger trees get so mature, they actually produce their own leaf litter because they are um, they are a rainforest tree. So they will actually create their own microenvironment beneath them. <laughs> so um, so mulch is only maybe for the first half decade or so, maybe. And after that, the trees will get big enough where they can create their own microclimate based on the leaves that fall. Great, thank you. All right, that that is all the questions I'm seeing in the chat at this time. I do want to um, invite people if you have more questions to raise your hand if you'd like to ask them verbally or type them into the chat. That's great. And while we're giving people the opportunity to do that, I would like to draw everybody's attention to the contact information for Sonia Rios. Um, I'm sure if you think of any questions after the fact, she'd love to make herself available. I don't want to put words in her mouth though, so. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then also draw you to our um, California Nevada chapter of the SWCS email that you could reach us at. We're also on Facebook. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we do record these webinars to make it available for the public. You can search CA dot or dash NV SWCS on YouTube. And that will take you to our channel. If you could please subscribe, then you could, you know, be notified anytime we post any new webinars. And it looks like we have a hand raised, Joel Kramer. Oh, he just put his hand, yep, okay. Would you like to unmute yourself, please? Hi there, uh, this is Joel. Sonia, thank you so much for the presentation, super informative. Um, excited to apply this to our demo site um, in Escondido, where we're uh, looking at uh, densifying a, a, a very old grove. I just want to invite everybody to an upcoming event um, about cover cropping um, in orchards. So if you haven't heard of it already, the link's in the chat and next Wednesday, um, we'll also be discussing some uh, conservation practices um, that might be relevant to you. Thanks again, Sonia. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I'll see you next week. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, Joel. All right, Kabir, you have your hand raised. Please unmute yourself and go for it. Hi, uh, Sonia. Yeah, it's a great uh, presentation. Uh, I have just a few questions about, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you are just putting mulch there just to protect the soil from or reduce the moisture, evaporation or evapotranspiration or what? Yes, we are. Um, we just applied the mulch, and I just highly stress it because that's just a basic uh, management practice that um, that we suggest that is done. You can never go wrong with mulch. Um, we're not trying any different types of mulches or anything like that. It's just you know the basic wood mulch, um, and I just highlighted it for this presentation um, to talk about water conservation and you know um, what growers are currently doing for that practice right now. Yeah, but you know, there are some other options like, you know, compost, you know, if you're putting in compost there, maybe it also produce or gives some or release some nutrients or biochar or combination of both uh, compared to mulching, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, like I said, there's different researchers working on different things. Um, and my research was just predominantly just to see what the high density planting does. Uh, not so much like the water, the managing the water and all that stuff is all secondary, but pretty much my primary um, parameter for this project is just in general looking at the yield for it. But um, yeah, that's something else that we can easily, you know, um, talk about. Um, we can we can um, possibly co-write a grant about using different about different methods because like I said I know Ben Faber works a lot with mulches and cover crops and all those different ways of conserving water as well um so 
I don't know if it's something that you might want to collaborate on or something in the future, but you are correct. There are many methods. Right. I'm actually working for, you know, USDN RCS and also mm -hmm. Soil and Water Conservation Society. <laughs> so, yeah, of course we can, you know, we are actually, I worked for the, you know, Soil Health Division of NRCS. So also okay. thinking about the Soil Health part of it. So, yeah, that's why I probably can put some nutrients in there so you don't have to add chemicals or something in there. Other thing I was also thinking, you know, like, are they, are you planting that high density plants in a fumigated, uh, you know, the uh, planting holes or how do you plant those things? I don't, the current high density trial in which my project is on, it's actually on the Cal Poly Pomona Santa Paula Pine Tree Ranch. And um, I don't know the history of it, but I don't think be just because the fact that it is a university property, I don't think they have done any, any type of fumigants or anything like that. Okay. Because, um, you know, the reason is I'm talking about like, uh, seems to me, you know, avocado is like highly dependent on microalgal fungus. Yes. You know, if you're fumigating it, you know, you're just uh, try to kill all the soil biology or soil habitats in there, including microalgal fungus. So that way, you know, it colonizes less with those kind of plants. You know. Yeah, you, usually for avocado trees, I have yet to hear of a grower that would fumigate prior to a planting. So that's not a traditional practice. So mm -hmm. luckily. <laughs> <laughs> How about the, you know, the nursery? Are they used that? fumigated soil or are they inoculated with some kind of biology in there? Uh, I'm sure they add some type of biology. I've taken a tour on Brokaw, which is um, Brokaw Nursery, which is where these trees have come from. And um, they do have like a special mix that they do use for their soil for each planting stage. Um, I don't know exactly what's in there. Um, I would have to find out through Brokaw. Exactly. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Great, thank you, Kabir. I do want to acknowledge there's a hand raise, but first let me hit this question in the chat that popped up. Do you have problems with voles in your mulch? With what? I'm voles. sorry. It's okay. Voles Pulse? in your mulch. Poles. Voles. V V O L E S. Um actually no. Um we don't have any problems with voles or any other vertebrate at that, you know, at that stage. Um, usually when we, when we see voles and things like that is when you add a cover crop in some parts um, of the state. In San Diego, I know we don't use cover crops because of the cost of water. When you first start it, you know, you have to add water to it. Um, but usually voles love where excess plants and weeds are being grown and grasses, and then that's when they usually pop up. And also, it, it also depends if you had a high population of voles or gophers or squirrels prior to planting. So you also have to be careful and take care of all that vertebrate problems before you even plant. But traditionally, no, you don't have problems with any type of vertebrates when it comes to mulch. It doesn't attract it or anything like that. Great. There is a hand raised. Tomas, if you'd like to unmute yourself and go for it. Hi, Sonia. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hey, so question. Um, you listed that basically with the high density um, um, plantings, uh, you're basically getting twice as many plants on average per acre. Uh, but on one of the slides, you did show that uh, waters were uh, the water amount was uh, about the same. So how many acre feet of water are we talking here that's being applied on these high density plantings? Um, uh, that's a good question because when we talked when I showed that it was calling Gary Bender's project and he was able to monitor the water, but he didn't do the project very thoroughly. So we didn't really get those numbers right away. That's why when these trees hit about three years old and we change them to micro sprinklers, we hope to get those numbers. 
okay. Yeah, yeah. So Gary, yeah, he didn't do a very good. (laughs) Something happened and we didn't get those numbers, but we kind of have an idea, but we don't have the proof and the concrete numbers there to show it because we didn't do the research correctly. Um, But hopefully, like I said, when these trees get three years old, we hopefully we're going to get in there and actually see what's going on with that. All right. Thanks. Great. Okay. Last call for any questions, comments, or additions to the conversation. And while we're waiting for those, give you about another 30 seconds. But in the meantime, I just want to express my gratitude to Sonia and um, to one of our directors, Celine, for thinking of you, because this has been a great topic and we we value your time and appreciate your, your wanting to come on and provide this, this service for all of our members in the California Nevada chapter of the SWCS. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you, Celine. <laughs> so, oh, go ahead, Celine. Uh, just thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Um, Sonia is our president, and Brandy is doing a really great job as bordering this event, and it wouldn't be possible without Sonia's expertise. She continues to um, impress me and educate me always, so it's just such a, um, we just really appreciate you. So thank you so much for your time and sharing your research with us. Uh, thank you. Hmm. All right, so with that, a final thank you and thank you to everybody that attended our webinar today and you can see us on YouTube, see the recording on YouTube and meet up with us on social media or our email. So thank you to everybody that tuned in and we look forward to seeing you for our next um, webinar. Keep an eye out for those invites. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Okay.